early on when we went by Saxby's Coffee, we were a franchise coffee company. You know, our focus, what we were going to hang our hat on was going to be hospitality, right? Taste of product, whether you're in the alcohol business, you're in the coffee business, you're in the hamburger business, taste of product is oftentimes very subjective. Mm -hmm. But how people make another person feel is very objective. It transcends culture, it transcends age, wealth. People like to be looked at in the eyes. They like to be you know, remembered. They like to be treated nicely. And so I always wanted our business to sort of hang our hat on something that could be objective. And so we really focused on being a hospitality business above all else. Um, but our mission statement has always been to make life better. Like how can we leverage the business that we're going to create, hopefully a business that will scale to be able to make people's life better. Sometimes it's as simple as give them a great coffee. Sometimes it's as simple as comp them their coffee because they're having a bad day. But it's also about how do we employ people? How do we de develop life skills for people? Because the coffee business is, is a great business to teach through, right? So the evolution of our business has gone from being a coffee coffee business, hanging its hat on hospitality. The hospitality has always stayed with us as part of our mission to make life better. But the evolution to, to what we are today, we now describe Saxby's as an education company disguised as a coffee company. It's on a mission to make life better by supporting and empowering the next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs through experiential learning. So, so that's the business that we've become today, 17 short years later. All right, well, Nick Bayer, welcome to the Entrepreneur Studio. Thanks, Chris. It's Where did you come here. in from? Came in from Philadelphia. Philadelphia. All right. Well, that's um, uh, I'd say one of my uh, unsung favorite cities. It is. It's. Uh, I didn't know how great it was when I moved there. You know, probably 15 years ago now. It's. It's a great place. Great place to call home. I've even you know gotten fully on board with all the sports teams, which is hard no growing up way. in Chicago to get rid of all my old you know growing up teams and, and be a full Philadelphia fan. But it's a, it's a great great city to live and visit. That's good. Well, um, you know Saxby's Coffee, right? It's uh, I'd say from what I, I love to hear about, it's known as a hospitality company that happens to be great at coffee. Um, you're also known for something that you've got emphasis on experiential education. So maybe tell us. What caused you to really link entrepreneurship and education? We've been at this at Saxby's for a really long time now, you know, and there's been several iterations and sort of pivots in the business, right? Early on when we went by Saxby's Coffee, we were a franchise coffee company. You know, our focus, what we were going to hang our hat on was going to be hospitality, right? Taste of product, whether you're in the alcohol business, you're in the coffee business, you're in the hamburger business, taste of product is oftentimes very subjective. Mm -hmm. But how people make another person feel is very objective. It transcends culture, it transcends age, wealth. People like to be looked at in the eyes. They like to be you know, remembered. They like to be treated nicely. And so I always wanted our business to sort of hang our hat on something that could be objective. And so we really focused on being a hospitality business above all else. Um, but our mission statement has always been to make life better. Like how can we leverage the business that we're going to create, hopefully a business that will scale to be able to make people's life better. Sometimes it's as simple as give them a great coffee. Sometimes it's as simple as comp them their coffee because they're having a bad day. But it's also about how do we employ people? Um, how do we de develop life skills for people? Because the coffee business is, is a great business to teach through, right? So the evolution of our business has gone from being a coffee, coffee business, hanging its hat on hospitality. The hospitality has always stayed with us as part of our mission to make life better. But the evolution to, to what we are today, we now describe Saxby's as an education company disguised as a coffee company. It's on a mission to make life better by supporting and empowering the next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs through experiential learning. So, so that's the business that we've become today, 17 short years later. You know, it, uh, it definitely flies by. Um, and I think one of the things that was really striking to me is where you have this juxtaposition between entrepreneurship and education, where, you know, education has typically been hands off. You know, it's sort of theoretical, ethereal at times. And it's like, hey, and now when you're in the real world, you got to figure it out and how you guys have stitched that together. But you have had your own entrepreneurial experience. And what was kind of the spark for you uh, of like, I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. What was sort of, where was some of the earliest? Yeah, I think there were some really early sparks that I certainly didn't recognized at the time, okay. right? Like in middle school, maybe a little bit in high school, a tiny bit in college, but 
from a, from a generational perspective, entrepreneurship wasn't taught or engaged or you know, pulled out of people, particularly in the higher ed space until really the last 10 years, right? So I'm of a generation when I was coming through higher ed, practically nobody was teaching or supporting entrepreneurship, right? So <clears throat> I was a, a bit of a square peg in a round hole. Like I knew that like traditional corporate life wasn't what made my heart race, but I didn't immediately jump to, therefore I should be an entrepreneur, right? Because no one was talking about yeah. that, right? So when I went to school, you know, and, and this is embedded deep in my story, right? That my parents, you know, were the first people in their family to go to college. Um, their freshman year, they met each other and found out nine months later they were going to be having a child. So they dropped out of school, moved back to Chicago, and took whatever jobs they could get. Right? My parents are in incredibly talented people, but when you don't have that diploma and yeah. you have the need to put food on the table for for a little kid, you get you get whatever job you can possibly get, and you blink, and thirty years goes by, and you stayed sort of in that industry, mm -hmm. and so. My parents are always really impressed upon me to get my education um, because it would allow me the opportunity to do whatever it is mm. that I'm passionate about. So I, I go to college and I had no idea, right? I mean, people were like, Nick, you like to talk a lot. You should be a lawyer. So I have essentially a political science degree, you know? <laughs> uh, I thought real estate was interesting. So I took a real, real estate internship. I thought finance was interesting, finance internship. So I did all these different things. And at 22, and, and this is really, I think, where the spark came from for me, at 22, I just started to pick up the phone, you know, back when they were actually attached to a wall with a cord. I picked up the phone and I started to call some people who made a huge difference in my life because I was really trying to f sort out, like, what is it that I'm going to do professionally? And that really, those calls were to coaches and teachers, a seventh grade teacher who encouraged my parents to send me away for school to a different school setup that might be more enriching for me from, from an academic perspective, my high school baseball and basketball coaches. And I remember hanging up the phone with them thinking to myself, they are so passionate about why they went into coaching and teaching, mm -hmm. right? To mold young people and help them pursue the things that they're passionate about. But in school, I'd spent a lot of time in businesses and there's nothing better than having to work together as a team to compete against competitors and take losses some days and have to come back and fight another day and try to you know, put one foot in front of another. So I love the competitiveness of business, but I really was motivated by the impact that coaches and teachers and people in the nonprofit space could make in, in other people's lives. So that spark for me at 22, and it, it didn't immediately turn into a fire, right? But that spark for me was, how can I put those two things together? Mm. How can I grow a competitive business that as it scales is not gonna just be focused on making more money, but also it's going to make a difference in people's lives, right? Mm. Today, we talk about social entrepreneurship quite commonly, right? Mm -hmm. And it's being taught in college, it's being taught in secondary school, but it wasn't when I was coming out of school, right? So I, w I felt a bit of a square peg in a round hole, but that spark was there. And I think my, my antenna went up and I started to really think about that as I, as I went into my you know, corporate life for a few years before eventually quitting, mm -hmm. starting to swipe my credit card and, and build what is, what is today's Saxby's. It's, it's amazing to, to uh, you know, time after time we have people sitting in the same seat that are just like, there was a moment that I decided to take the risk and <clears throat> it, you know, whatever the risk was, it didn't matter. It was the, it was the sort of the, the thrill of the hunt, the chase, the thing that was matter that mattered most, my purpose, all that kind of stuff. But something that you just said that I thought was really powerful is the spirit of entrepreneurship for you uh, was about winning together rather than an entrepreneur winning on their own. Yep. And I, I, I think that, um, I wonder if that's a theme that you've, you've really sort of discovered, unpacked, have some thoughts of is the winning together, uh, kind of approach. What are, what are some of the, what swayed you in that direction to be like, it's a team sport entrepreneurship, busy building businesses as a team sport. Yeah, I, mean, I think part of it was was growing up as an athlete, right? I played sports my entire life and I noticed that sometimes if we had the best player on the team, which sometimes was me, most times it wasn't me, but whoever the best player was, rarely did we win because we just had the best player, mm. right? It was some of my, my best teams that I was on were the teams where there was so much equalness and talent, but there was so much camaraderie and culture and sense of purpose in the organization. So I think that like that was naturally embedded in me by playing sports for a long time. But I was, I know I was always so focused. Like once I made the decision to start my business, I was always so focused on scale 
like that scale is important. We can impact more people's lives by growing. It was never about like, oh, I can make a hundred dollars if I open another location, or I can open a five thousand if I open another location. Like it was, it was never money purely that was going to drive the scale. It was we can impact more people's lives by scaling more, right? And so our business, like we do some very interesting things, right? At Saxby's, our average cafe does almost a, a million dollars a year in revenue on an annualized basis, right? And because they're student run, exclusively student run, that means that each cafe is employing about 50 students, right? So as a student CEO, you are running a million dollar business and managing 50 of your peers. And we're doing that across many different states and hopefully we're gonna scale across the country and, may, and maybe beyond, right? And so I knew that if this business was gonna be about Nick Bayer, it would never see a second location. Right. But if, if we could hire people who shared our mission, shared our core values, and they felt like and actually were entrepreneurial, we get the best out of them. And you start to add up more and more of those people. And then all of a sudden you can do something that most people thought could never be done. You could never have 50 undergraduate students be responsible for a business 24, 7, 365 and run a successful for profit business. You could never do it times 25 times 100 times, mm -hmm. hopefully one day 3000, right? We're doing it because it's about the group. It's about everyone being entrepreneurs. It's not about an entrepreneur who once had an idea and started a business. I love that. I love that. So you touched on the model. So why don't you break down the sort of initial framework of Saxby's and how you went from franchise to like, we're going to stitch to, to, you know, universities. Yeah. So right around 2013, we received an investment from a, from a private equity group. And, you know, it's, I, I, I smile thinking about it now because I'm like, I'm not sure that was a very investable business, you know? And so, but they saw something in us. And at the time when they first invested in our business, we were 100% franchise owned and operated. But right around that same time, 2013, that's when, you know, entrepreneurship started to really take off in higher ed. And, you know, we talked about Philadelphia at the outset of this. Philadelphia is nothing if not a huge college town, right? There's like 50 institutions of higher education yeah, in and around the city of Philadelphia. And so with it being such a big college town and everyone starting to teach entrepreneurship, they were looking for entrepreneurs and residents. They were looking for people to come into the classroom and talk about and show the battle scars. Like if you could do it all over again, how would you do it better? And I'm like, it's great because I have a PhD in failure. So let me tell you about all the things that I've messed up, right? So next thing I know, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time in higher ed, big schools, small schools, um, higher, you know, higher ed, secondary ed. And I loved it, right? Because I, th I think the best way to learn is to teach, right? Is to sit in front of people and share your experiences and seeing the reactions and seeing the really insightful questions. I was learning so much, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm, I went to uh, Cornell in upstate New York, and it's only about three and a half hours from Philadelphia. And so I became the first entrepreneur residence in, in what was then the Cornell Hotel School, now part of the business program. And I remember thinking to myself, like crazy imposter syndrome, like what am I going to teach anybody about entrepreneurship? And they're like, no, look, Nick, just you know, share your experiences. And so I go up there and, and actually over your shoulder, Chris, is a book setting the table. I know Danny was, was on your podcast. And so that was one of the first books I read. It was given to me by a professor at, at Cornell. And I remember reading that book being like, oh my God, the principles that are in this book exist in some places at Saxby's and not in others, wow. right? And so I was driving from Philadelphia to, to Cornell every month for five straight years, right? It's a lot of windshield time to just be thinking. And so higher ed is exploding in entrepreneurship. Um, Saxby's has always been a very entrepreneurial business, running our cafes with CEOs, cafe executive officers. We'd all, our business has always resonated well with young people. So anytime we had a location around either young residents or college campuses, those usually performed better. And higher ed was looking for what they called experiential learning. How can we take what we're teaching in the classroom, how to write a business plan, how to raise money, how yes. to create a SWOT analysis, how do we allow our students to push a door open and then go put that to play? How can they learn experientially, learn by doing? I was thinking to myself, I'm like, our business has always been very entrepreneurial. And if you think about all the moving parts that run through a Saxby's, you know, a million dollar operation where you've got a global supply chain, you've got finance, you've got, you know, recruiting, HR, everything that happens in any business, a behemoth like, like Heartland or a small little place like a neighborhood coffee shop, the coffee shop might be the perfect vehicle to teach business. And so, you know, I, I brought this like half baked idea to the president of Drexel University, a really entrepreneurial guy in Philadelphia. And I said, hey, President Fry, you know, you guys are teaching entrepreneurship. You're doing it phenomenally well. 
but your students are looking for an opportunity to learn by doing. And so we we were first partners. We partnered eight years ago where engineering students designed and then students from all academic disciplines every day since have run their own tax piece. They get full credit, full wages, and have full P&L authority, right? They make mistakes every single day. But there's no better way to learn than by making mistakes, mm-hmm. right? And so that was the that was sort of like the original concept of the idea. But there were so many people who said it's a great idea, you can never actually scale it, right? And so we never thought that it was going to become the thing that we've done as a business. Yeah, but you didn't you know it was forward. a pilot. Yeah. No, no, it was, it was really just like a cool thing. It was almost like an itch to scratch, you know, and hearing people say there's no way you could actually do that made me want to do it that much more, right? Wow. Our teams to say like, let, let's get together and prove people that we can do this. So how did you um, sort of build that initial team to say, hey, we're going to take concept and we're going to start to create a repeatable process, you know, that's going to become a core part of the business? Yeah, I mean, look, there's there's actually a lot of the core principles that we focused when we were first opening that location. Like everyone at Zachary's calls that first one OG Drexel. Like it's our, it's our original one, it's at Drexel. We opened a second one at Drexel. We now have 25 of these cafes, you know, spread throughout your know, college campuses. But you know, our core principles were you could sit down and interview someone and say, hey, Chris, you know, mind you, Chris is 19 years old in this instance. You're interviewing to be the student CEO. Have you ever managed 50 of your peers? The answer is no. Have you ever run and had P&L authority for a million dollar business? The answer is no. Right. I've interviewed every single person who's ever been a finalist for a student CEO. The answer has been no every single time. So we said, let's hire for attitude. You know, let's hire for a passion for our mission statement to make life better, our six core values. Like, let's hire for those sort of innate human skills and teach to the skills necessary to be able to sort of run a business. And so that was the original decision that we made back when we hired Kelsey Goslin, who was the original student CEO. And that's a lot of what we do really today, right? Is like, that's, it's so important to build the right culture. That's uh, incredible. So what's the career sort of trajectory? What happens like with Kelsey? What was sort of like, still running uh saxby's or doing something else the beauty is is like you know there's a little bit of both right so you know we've now had uh well well over 200 former student ceos right and and we are when we partner with universities we don't have a lot of like requirements per se one requirement though is that it cannot be strictly for hospitality students or even just business students and and the, the idea for that is that the skills you're going to hone in, in having this experience are what we call the power skills, things you can't learn in the classroom, emotional intelligence, critical thinking, cultural agility, um, resilience, right? Things that everyone needs, regardless of what you're going to do professionally in your career. And so as a result, our students have come from, I think, 60 different majors at this point, right? They come from marketing, they come from finance, but they come from nursing, engineering. We have dance majors who have come through this program. And so they have gone into a myriad of different careers. But there's a there's a lot that we're really proud of, right? So according to the Harvard Business Review, the average college graduate gets their first leadership position seven years after graduation. As you and I both know, it's really hard to manage people. I've been managing people a long time. I still struggle with it. It's still really, really hard. And therefore, when you come out of college, it takes a long time for someone to tap you and say, you're ready to manage people. Our former student CEOs get their first leadership position post-college 12 months after graduation seven times faster than their peers, right? They have a different level of experience and an ability to be able to articulate what they've done. So when they get hired, they oftentimes stand out and start moving into leadership positions, right? Which is really awesome. The second side of this is, you know, as a growing business, right? We have investors, we have a lot of desire to scale, to continue to make life better, to bring this to learners of all shapes and sizes. We have the best minor league system in business. So many of our former student CEOs and student leaders in our cafes graduate and they join us corporately, right? So as we continue to scale our business, we've got this great minor league system that we can tap totally. and we can move into markets to support the next generation of, of student leaders. Yeah, it's a bench squad. You know, it's a, uh, it's a, that's a huge leg up that a lot of businesses don't have. And, and the, I think the idea of practice uh, is really important. And you bring up a really, um, I'm going to say important point as it relates to people leadership. And I wonder, um, <clears throat> having those, that, that, those core values, I want you to share what those core values are. And then let's kind of start talking about, you know, leadership development, because here's what I would say. If there's uh, anything that I learned, um, I thought early in my career that leadership was, um, you had the authority to control outcomes. Mm-hmm. 
And I have learned that it has nothing to do with that. Right. Yep. <laughs> you cannot control the outcomes. Right. And um, I, I will say like um, there, that leaves a wake in people. And I really love what you said is that you, you the objective thing is how people feel yep. and employees have to feel that. So talk to us a little bit about the value system and how that sort of uh, translates into leadership development. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the benefits that I, I get to have now as, as our business, you know, we've got a lot of tremendously talented people at what we call the Saxby's HQ, right? These are, these are the support system for our student CEOs and the, and the folks that are in the field supporting the student CEOs directly. So I get to spend a lot of time working directly with the student CEOs, right? So I, I see them in their interview process. I see them at, at training camp where they come to Philadelphia and they, you know, they go through, you know, a, a very intensive training process. And then I go to their campuses sort of throughout the semester. And, you know, if you throw I don't, I don't care if you're my age or you're 20, if you throw a thousand things, like you got to do this and this and this and this, and this, they're going to never, they're going to never remember any of those things. Right. So it's about keeping things simple. And the thing that I tell them at that student CEO, they have coffee with me the first day of training camp, right? And they're all really excited and also really nervous, right? Because they know that this is hard, right? We make it clear to them that this is a consequence rich environment. It's demanding. Right? Like when we meet, when I meet with university presidents, it's one of the most important things that I make clear is that we don't give people a cute title and then wrap them in bubble tape and actually just do it for them. It's quite the opposite. This is very consequence rich, right? It's not going to be for everybody. Like we really throw them in the deep end, but the pool is surrounded by lifeguards, right? And so we're not going to just pull them across the pool. They're going to struggle. They're going to ch choke on some water. We're going to pull them up. We're going to show them the video and then they have to swim themselves across, right? So when I meet with them at that very first one, usually they'll prompt it or I will make sure I bring up like sort of three things I always want them to be thinking about. I think great leaders um, it's, I call it be like three things to be, you know, is that you should be kind, you should be real and you should be consistent, right? So be kind, uh, you know, you said it before, Chris, that like, I know when I first became a leader, I was like, oh, I have, I have to act like I have all the answers. Like someone made me a supervisor. I have all the answers. Oh, what a horrible leader I was. You know, I it was like, it's not about having all the answers, right? It's like, be kind, be under, you know, like let people understand that you're a real person and you default to kindness. Second is be real, be who you are. I was pretending like I was someone so much more experienced mm. than I was when I first started to manage people and they could see right through it. And the third one, which I think is, it's not sexy, right? But if you think about the people that are great leaders, they are consistent, right? You don't have to tiptoe in their office and say, is Chris having a good day or a bad day? Chris is having his normal day. He's consistent. Right. And playing on that consistent plane, I think, is so important. And so those those are the three pieces of advice that I give our student CEOs. Right. They get a lot of other support. They have a lot of former student CEOs that are supporting them to teach them the technicalities of being a cafe executive officer at Saxby's. But those are the things when we talk about leadership development, because that will make them not just a great leader at Saxby's, but a great leader post Saxby's. 95 percent of them are going to leave Saxby's after they graduate college or they're going to go somewhere else. So we have a really important responsibility as a company to teach the skills necessary for them to run successful cafes for us, but also those skills that will translate into whatever they do in mm. their career. And I just think that like being nice, being kind, excuse me, be, being kind, um, being real and being consistent is going to help you regardless of what you do with your career. I mean, uh, the, the thing that is really powerful about that is, uh, living by those values as a leader, I think, um, really does instill something in the person that's in practice. Right. And I think that there's probably levels of being kind, there's probably levels of being real. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you know, we all change and we grow. And I think that that's one of the things that's probably really great about the from day one to their exit, right? That they've probably grown in those areas. Tremendously, right? right? Because being real for you is gonna be a little bit different than me, right? Like I'm a very verbal person, right? So by I, I try to embrace the fact I'm a verbal person and therefore my the way I express my niceness is oftentimes going to be very verbal. There's other people, we've had some tremendous student CEOs who probably say one one hundredth less words a day than I do, right? Like I'm a very verbal person. I don't, we don't teach them or encourage them to speak a lot because Nick speak a lot. We want you to be you, be real, be consistent and comfortable in your own skin. Mm -hmm. Your leadership size, how you will show niceness and kindness will come through as a result of that. 
if you're consistent. Oh, I love right? that. Like that's what we do. But look, they, they all struggle, right? It's really hard to do what they're doing. Many people don't get that kind of level of responsibility until they're deep into their careers. You know, oftentimes double the age of what our student CEOs are. So they do struggle. But I think it all, again, comes back to like the mission core values of our business, right? Like they signed up for a business that's in the business of making life better. Mm -hmm. And our core values are that central North Star. So when it feels like the proverbial roof is falling on your head, that is the North Star. Because they don't always have corporate leaders right there in the cafe when there are three call outs or a vendor doesn't show up or there's, you know, businesses up two times higher than we than we had projected for the day. When you're really in it, you know, we're not there in their earpiece saying this is what you do. It's just happening. It's happening right in front of them, right? The mission core values, that is the North Star that we always want ringing in their head. Mm -hmm. And they make great decisions. You know, they, they, they struggle. They ultimately make great decisions. And they come out the other side an incredibly more mature and incredibly more experienced and more importantly, a more self-confident person. Right? Yeah. You don't know what you're capable of until you're challenged. Human nature is we want to avoid challenge. Right. And, and today, like as parents of society, we try to hide people from being challenged. Mm -hmm. Right. And so oftentimes our young people, this is the first time they're really having adversity in their life. But you don't know how, how what what greatness you're capable of until you're really challenged. That's so we're good. in that business. Right. We're in the business of challenging you, but we're supporting you through that challenge. It's not about putting you down or making you cry. It's about, you know, letting you face your fears and come out the other side and the gratitude they have for it, the way they point back to this being such a life altering experience makes my job the best job there is, right? I can't imagine doing anything better. Uh, I, it's a it's a really incredible model. It sounds like you've got some really incredible um, stories and outcomes. Uh, it sounds like it's something that's really great for the student, though hard as crap, I'm sure. Um, uh, for the business of Saxby's, change management sounds like something that you have to really face because if you think about it, you have... CEO, student CEO transitions probably every six months. Yeah, often. So talk to us a little bit about how you've installed some sort of business practice process for change management. Years ago, we realized how could we take what everyone is going to perceive as our greatest weakness and actually turn it into a strength. Imagine a Heartland or a Saxby's or any business changing their CEO, right? The, the highest person on the org chart changing that person every half year. You'd be like, wow, that's a recipe for failure. You're going to fail. So we said, we're not going to fail. So how do we actually turn that into being a great strength and a great learning opportunity, right? And so the way that we do that from a change management perspective, it's about talent curation and talent retention. Meaning we know as Chris comes in as a student CEO on January 1st, right? Your tenure starts January 1st, you end on June 30th. We know June 30th is coming and it always comes really, really fast. So knowing that you're going to be sort of stepping down as student CEO on June 30th, how do we prepare ourselves to not just keep the wheels on the bus, but how can we actually let the bus drive even faster and drive even better come July 1st? That talent needs to be on that team, right? Chris needs to be a great servant leader. He needs to be someone who identifies trains and empowers and retains talent around him. So when Chris moves on, that next student CEO is on that team. We have a, almost a 100% success rate of internal promotion, right? And so that for change management for us is that we have a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of leaders in our cafes, right? If the student CEO is out that day or is visiting their parents or is, is sick that day, if the business were to fall apart, that's a terrible leadership model. No one wants to work in that kind of business. Whereas if a lot of other people are well-trained and empowered to be able to make decisions, that business can move forward and can actually lose its CEO every six months and get better because each student CEO comes in. Like you might have an engineer student CEO who's great at process and then the next student CEO is great at marketing. So they inherit a business that has great process in place, but then they get to flex their own unique muscles from a marketing perspective. So I think that we have, I mean, are, are we perfect? Of course not right? There's a lot of things for us to be able to improve. But one of the things I'm so, so passionate about is how we're taking a very, very perceived weakness and making it a strength. We continue to build on the individual strengths of our, of our people. And there's no greater, you know, more fun thing to do as a leader than to develop talent and watch them succeed after you step down. Because most of our student CEOs do this as, as juniors, right? So Chris has, is a student CEO. His tenure ends. You bump down to the number two person on the team. 
right? You go, you go into the certified position. And so as the new student CEO, you've got a nice you know, safety net because the former student CEO is typically there, but it's also, you get to flex humility as the former student CEO that you're not the number one anymore, right? So it creates this really unique dynamic that again, translates outside of Saxby's. It allows us to be great while, while they're running our business for us, but it also allows them to be great as they're moving forward in their careers to lean on that level of experience. Yeah. It's a great safeguard that uh, bump into the number two and, and to, uh, uh, recognize that uh, leadership is a cascaded, uh, decentralized thing. It isn't about being the leader is the only person with leadership. Everybody is either leading themselves, leading others, leading the business. Yeah, right? I mean, because they're taught to be CEOs. They have to look at the business 360, right? They have to look at it holistically. And every great person wants to be promoted. Right. But it, once they start looking at it from an organizational perspective, we can't promote you unless we've got a tremendous backfill for you. So we teach the student CEOs the responsibility of developing that backfill is you. Don't look to the company to do it. Create your successor. And then it makes it so much easier for us to promote you into the into the next role. And so, again, it works really well for us internally at Saxby's. But I love seeing I love talking to our student CEOs who are three, four, seven years out of college now talking about how they apply those same principles in whatever industry that they're actually in now. Uh, uh, that is phenomenal. I, I think one of the coolest things about this is to be to have the real um, onus, pressure, uh, weight of leadership on you. And I, my mentor said the same thing. He's like, Chris, you're not learning if you're not teaching. And so I think that's re a really incredible idea to get somebody to learn leadership fast. And it's kind of a baptism by fire with what you guys have do are, are doing. So it's really powerful. I wonder um, if you could expound a little bit on being a mission driven business and talk a little bit about, you know, the uh, doing well by doing good kind of thing to talk about that sort of um, pillar or sort of central sort of thing in your business about it being mission driven and, and why that why that matters and, and what's sort of the the way that you uh, sort of propagate that message. Yeah, I think there, there's like two really critical things to that for me. I think the, the first was growing up in my parents house for 18 years, right? They they went into industries, they went into jobs that weren't necessarily the things that made their heart race, right? Like my mom wanted to be a business person, an entrepreneur, my dad wanted to be a coach and a teacher. But as teenage parents starting a family, you're pretty much just gonna take whatever job you get, right? So sitting at the dinner table with them for 18 years, I would hear them you know, talk about how they felt like a number and they weren't empowered and they weren't doing what they love to do. And so I put that deep into my head and said, if I ever get into a position where I'm gonna be a leader, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur, I want to do something about that because I, I wouldn't want people to feel in my organization the way that my parents felt in, in their organization. So, so that was one. And then two, like I, I really believe that people want to work for people, not necessarily companies, right? Like I think the importance of leadership, you know, and the, and the camaraderie that you see from people to people. And so that's why we've gone so aggressively into this company having a lot of CEOs. Right? Like most companies have one CEO, we have a lot of CEOs. And when I go into a, a student CEO's cafe, they're the primary student CEO, right? So if they need the napkins changed out, if the trash is overflowing, they'll turn to me saying, hey, Nick, can you empty the trash for me? We're a little short staff today. And, and the culture that we have of servant leadership at the company is, is really, really important, right? So those are the two things that I always wanted to be able to solve for is I wanted people to feel like they were working for a very humane business that, that meant something to the mm. world and to the people that worked in it. And I wanted people to, to feel entrepreneurial, right? I, I wanted them because I, I don't define entrepreneurship as, as strictly the creation of a business. It's easy to create a business, right? You can go and incorporate a business. You can come up with a tagline and a website. That's easy. How you scale and improve an organization in a competitive environment takes way more than one person. And those are the truly great companies is when they are just loaded with entrepreneurs, people that approach their job every single day, like they own the business and feel empowered and comfortable making decisions to compete and differentiate, right? So I think those are the things that we always have really tried to do entrepreneurial is, um, entrepreneurially as, as an organization. That's really good. I think uh, um, there's, a, there's a social impact that you guys are having as well. Um, and I'm wondering what are some of the things that you've seen uh, that have surprised you uh, with the college campus, you know, approach um, and the way that a community sort of bands together, right, to, to make the CEO, you know, the student CEO successful? Yeah, you know, in, in the early days of Saxby's, back when we were a franchise business and we started to own some locations ourselves corporately, 
I always, I always loved the coffee business because we can, we can and do serve and employ any and everyone, right? So for many years, we were partnering with great organizations like Youth Build and Big Brothers Big Sisters to give people who were oftentimes going to have a really hard time getting employed, not only give them jobs, but give them jobs where they were really valued, right? Mm. We, we didn't say, oh, we hired this person out of Youth Build, so you get treated differently than someone who we just hired from a college, right? Like they were treated like peers. And we saw them really, really thrive in that, right? And so that's what we, we realized, like our commitment to social impact and embedding it at the core of our business, not just once a year doing a community event where we all dress up and donate money or do something, but we wanted impact to be sort of embedded in the core of what, what we did as a business. What do we do? We employ and serve people, right? So it had to be something that we put at the center of that. And so we did that for many, many years. We built up a reputation, particularly in Philadelphia, where we're based for many, many years as being known as a great community hire, you know, a, a business that was really focused on not just giving things away, but actually giving people opportunity to be able to grow. Because if you can go and work in a, in a really bustling F&B establishment, those are skills that are going to translate and help you into a lot of other things. As our, as our business started to move more in the higher ed space, that's when we realized like we could, we could really make a difference in people um, from both a resume perspective as well as a self-confidence perspective, right? And so higher ed is a beautiful thing because you have people from all walks of life. You have people who come from very, very successful families and you have people who come from the complete opposite. No one's ever stepped foot on a college campus before. They are afraid. They have imposter syndrome. They don't know where they're going. We are a home for all of those people, mm. all of them, right? Like our current crop of student CEOs going into the, the fall of 2023, our current crop are 50% of them are first generation college students. These are the first people in their family that have ever gone to college. That's powerful. Six months from now, they're going to have on their resume that they ran a million dollar business and managed dozens and dozens of their peers and self-confidence and humility that goes with that the trajectory of their life changing is real, right? Like we're seeing it. It's not real because Nick Bayer says it's real. It's real because we're tracking everyone who goes through these programs. There's evidence. There's, there's tons of evidence, right? And they're connected to their, their peers, right? Our former student CEOs who have gone through this are connected to them. They're part of an alumni network. The same way you are with your fraternity or your sorority or your, your university's alumni network, we have the student CEO alumni network, right? So I just connected... Um, a graduating student CEO from Community College of Philadelphia. She really wants to go into finance. So I, I connected her to, to Tahid Buckman, who was our inaugural student CEO at our second Drexel location. Tahid is a fast rising leader at JP Morgan, one of the best banks in the world. And Tahid is a first generation college student, um, lost his dad when he was nine years old, almost dropped out of school. And he's this tremendously successful young man. So now Amira gets to be directly co connected to Tahid to be able to figure out whether finance is right. And likely Tahid's going to be able to pull some strings and get her an internship to oh, see if it's yeah. right for her. Right. So it's just really, really powerful stuff. And higher ed is a beautiful thing because you have people from all different walks of life and all different backgrounds. And, and we can be such a synergistic value add, va value provider for our higher ed partners, for students to get this real world experience to figure out who they are and have the resume and skills set to go, go, go pursue the things that they love. Yeah, well, I, I would say that um, when I heard you kind of, uh, kind of walk through that, but then when I heard you uh, on, I think it was a video that I watched that you talked about really the three pillars of business. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of talk about entrepreneurship and I want to talk about those three pillars, but there's, there's really like you're starting up. So you got to come up with the idea, right? Then they're starting up. There's a building all the sort of processes, right? What you, all the product that you're going to select, how much you're going to charge for all that, where you're going to sell all that kind of stuff. There's that sort of what I put in the startup bucket. And then you've got the exit bucket when, if you own the business, how are you exiting? But I think one of the things that's powerful is you guys focus kind of right in the middle with the three pillars where you got team development, community leadership, and financial management yep. are really kind of the three pillars. So what, what made you pick the middle, if you will, on operating a business, that aspect of entrepreneurship? Yeah, you know, I think, again, we, we focus everything that we do around that intersection of we need to teach young leaders how to be able to run a Saxby really successfully, right? Because our whole business hinges upon that. But then we also want those skills to be very transferable post this experience, right? And so every great organization has their principles around something like the three pillars, right? But we use the the analogy, um, you know, of 
having a, a three, you know, three legged stool, if you will, right? And if you have only two of them exist, the, the stool falls over. Or if you have two that are really, really strong and really, really high, and the other's really, really short and, and poor, it's gonna, gonna tip over as well. And so the three pillars um, of equal proportion, but in a particular order, are what really important to us, right? That first one, as you said, is team development, right? So great leaders, great organizations develop and hire people based on their fit to culture, right? So it's about who do you hire? Who do you open the castle doors up to let into your organization? The right answer is generally that there's a, there's a great culture fit. And you can only have culture if you have mission core values. So you have a defined set of things that you believe in and that you all sort of pursue every single day, right? So what team, what talent do you attract into your business? How well do you train them? How well do you retain them as an organization? Our student CEOs have direct responsibility for that. The second pillar is community leadership. Some would call it marketing. Some would call it philanthropy, right? Like, why is the community going to support your business? Why do you exist, right? And then how do you talk to people about what it is that you do? So, you know, fraternities, sororities, student organizations email our corporate website all the time where people will stop me saying, Nick, can you support our organization at Drexel? I'm like, it's not my decision. Contact our student CEO. It's their decision. They have their own budgets. They know what organizations to be able to support and how to best support them, right? So the community leadership side, what do you do to, be able to make your community better? Why are they going to support you? And then the third, and we think it's a byproduct of those first two, is your finances. You know, how, how does your revenue look? How did you manage your costs? What is your bottom line? But I know when our student CEOs present this, their profit and loss statements every single month, I know if we're seeing a profit and loss statement that's off, the issue is not the financial side of it. The issue is upstream. It's likely going to be the team side. Yeah, you know, once they get to the point where they're like, oh, you know what? We had two times higher turnover this semester than we expected to have, or we don't have the right number of sort of a trainers. We don't have all these kinds of things. When their team development, the talent bucket is off, the rest of it's going to be off. Right. Again, those are the pillars. Like when they really master those three pillars and put them into play, we see success in their business and we see them have great success, you know, post business as well. So the three pillars are like, that's, that's sort of the mastery of leadership that, that yeah. we really try to teach people to. And do they master it in January? No. Do they master it in March? Not really. Do they typically get to mastery by the end of the semester? Yes. Right. And then oftentimes they bump down, they become the number two in their cafe. And so they get to help that next student CEO be even better at mastering the three pillars. I love it. I love it. And, uh, I, one of the things that I was wondering about, you know, just practically speaking, you know, kind of picking on the the financial management side, they got their own budgets. Um, you know, this is, uh, from what I understand, it's a franchise uh, framework, a franchise approach to to running Saxby's. Do how do, how does Saxby's corporate sort of, uh, you know, not 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 only remain profitable, right? But how do you drive sort of the corporate business? How do you finance the corporate business with the locations or is it all investor investor funded yeah no i mean these cafes are for profit right so that's that's the beauty of this is that it's we're not a non-profit right we are a for-profit business the way that we generate cash flow in our business is at the unit level right so a university says hey we're, we're, we want to put a saxby's in our student union right here um they they build the cafe so the capex comes from sort of the, the university but the only way Saxby's makes money is by the bottom line, mm -hmm. right? So we have a lot of incentive to ensure that we drive revenue and we manage cost and we do it with 18 to 22 year olds, mm -hmm. right? So that's the beauty of it is that we have a lot of skin in the game in these situations, but we have a lot of confidence in our young leaders. We have a lot of confidence in our systems. We have a lot of confidence in, in the protocols that we have in place to be able to support them to make good decisions to run the business profitably, right? And I think we take a huge step back on the business, right? We're a certified B Corp. So I think that there's only 1,200 certified B Corps in the US because it measures all your non-financial decisions, right? Like any business person can look at a balance sheet, can look at a P&L and sort of understand the financial health or lack thereof in a particular business. Well, how do you measure a business for all their non-financial decisions? How diverse are they? How do they pay people? How do they make decisions in the business? What does their supply chain look like? How do they treat vendors, all stakeholders of the business? And so we wanted a business that was gonna be you know, holistically successful, not just financially, but we wanted to be great from a non-financial perspective as well. And so one of the only sort of certifications that exist out there that's cer certainly well-regarded is, is 
from B Lab. It's called B Cert, you know, B Corp Certified. And so we pursued that. It took us many, many years to eventually chin the bar we did three years ago, right? So those businesses were actually a public benefit company as well. So we change our article of incorporation where we make decisions to benefit all stakeholders, not just our shareholders, right? We're still a for-profit business, right? So we have to make money for our shareholders, but we think that we will do that and do that better by prioritizing our stakeholders, our employees, our communities, our, our, our vendors of equal proportion. And so I think that because we have been able to, to generate pretty significant social outcomes, particularly in education, right? Every former student CEO has graduated. Every former student CEO is employed in an industry that they choose, right? And you look at the higher ed space, only a little bit more than 50% of all students who enter higher ed ever graduate. Right. So our education outcomes are really, really significant. And I think it's those education outcomes that are actually driving our financial performance. We would have never got to our level of financial performance if it wasn't for the educational and, and social outcomes. And so it's that flywheel of education, social success that's driving financial success. And if we start making decisions to only benefit our financial side, I think the brakes will, will, will start to come off the bus, right? Mm -hmm. we, we will lose you know, the education outcomes and ultimately lose our financial outcomes as well. So that's why impact is so important to us, right? Like I'm not, I do not believe that someone's going to be like, all right, I'm showing up at University of Oklahoma. Let me search um, what coffee shops are B Corps. That's where I'm going to go. You might have one student who does that. You can't run a business off that, right? But I think that once people choose you because you run a good business and they peel back the layers of the onion and they see at the core that you're a well-run business that treats people well, you treated stakeholders well, they're going to be so much more loyal to you. They're going to become marketers for your business, right? Yeah, and so advocates. that's what we're really, yeah, they're going to become advocates to your business. So that's what we're really focused on. But I don't think we would have ever gotten to the financial model that we have today if it wasn't for our social success, if it wasn't for our educational outcomes. That's powerful. That's powerful. You uh, you talked um, uh, a little bit about um, uh, the the financial the financial success. How are you like? How do you get scale to open up more locations? What is sort of like the the framework to go? Hey, it's time to do a new location. Are you constantly looking for them? How do you how do you sort of go into the we're going we're gonna to have a new location and a new region. Yeah. So right now, I mean, we are, we are far too reactive, meaning we, it's a great luxury that we have that universities reach out to us saying, I heard you on a podcast. I saw this article. I saw, you know, I saw one of my colleagues at an, at a conference and they talked about this experiential learning Saxby. So right now everything is very inbound and we're very reactive to all of the interest, but that's a, that's a good problem to have, right? Is like, we are very focused on, on growing. So we, we, one of our six core values is profit creates opportunity. Some companies, they, they generate profit. They put it in the pocket of a few. We you know, generate profit and it creates opportunities for us to grow, right? So we started Drexel University, a very famous co-op private school, you know, and then we went to Temple University, a flagship public university in Pennsylvania. We're also at the Community College of Philadelphia. We're also at Bowie State University, a historically black college, right? If, if we didn't have a core value like profit creates opportunity, we would have made this experience for only a certain sector of higher ed. Mm -hmm. It's not who we are culturally, right? We are taking the profit we're generating as a business and investing heavily to create opportunities for students who otherwise wouldn't get this kind of opportunity. And so you know, that's something that is that's just really, really important to us as, as we try to sort of scale this business. So right now, a lot of it is inbound. For us to become a great you know, partnership, I, I don't love the word sales. So for us to become a great partnership organization, we've got to invest more heavily in that side of the business. Mm -hmm. right? We've got to have sort of more people who are widening the funnel, understanding what makes a great partner, having the right outreach to that, and then being able to have the processes in place to go from early conversation to partnership as quickly as possible, knowing that most of our partners right now are higher ed. Higher ed is a pretty awesome place. One thing it's not known for is being quick or entrepreneurial, right? right? And so this is true. we can't control that. We, we should and will focus on what we can control is how quick and entrepreneurial we are so that, that process can go a little bit faster because Look, I'm so proud of this. Like we have built something really special, right? Like the young people who are coming through this are succeeding in life. Like this, this is a part. We're not the reason why they're being successful, but we are a reason for them being successful. We want to share it with a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? And so we need to get out of our own way and be able to continue to, to overhaul and improve our own systems to ensure that we can provide this opportunity that, that so many young people deserve. Mm -hmm. Well, so from the inception of Saxby's to today, how has your job changed? Yeah, you know, I think 
you in the early days, and it's probably not uncommon to, to most entrepreneurs, right? Like you have to sort of wear every hat. You have to be sort of like the main barista and the real estate person and the finance person. The reality is, is I'm not good at most of those things, right? So I think I'm finally getting to focus on the things, the very few things, to be honest with you, that I'm actually good at, right? I have experts in this company at all of the things that I'm just not good at, right? I care about making a difference in people's life. Like that's the thing that makes my heart race. Like sitting in my finance meetings, yeah, I have to do it. I'm the CEO of the company. Sitting in our marketing and our product and our education meetings, yeah, I have to do it. The people who run those things at Saxby's are so much better at it than me. And that's what makes their heart race. I like the human impacts out of it, right? Like I like meeting with our university leaders, talking about what their goals are for their university and what we can do to support those goals. And then meeting with our young people, you know, meeting with our leaders, inspiring them, sharing my experiences, right? Like my talks with them are not about, I've got the world figured out. Let me just show you the, 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 you know, the sale book or the, the pitch book on that. I've made so many mistakes. Like how can I help you make less mistakes than me and make better decisions faster than I was able to do. So I love that side of the business. So, so in many ways, my role um, has evolved in a way where I get to do the few things that I'm actually good at and have hired people that are just really good and really passionate at the many things that I'm not good at. And I think that's a, that's a great luxury. And honestly, I wish I would have had the foresight to do those things a little bit faster. Okay. Well, you know, I, I'd say if someone that is a student CEO has their own budget, just tell me a little bit about like, um, you know, you've got these functions of uh, product, right? If you're going to roll out a new product, if you're going to improve on one, you got to chain, make a change on a product Then you've got marketing, right? You've got things like pricing. How do you um, sort of enable or provide the resources at the, at your sort of corporate level that can support these student CEOs or, or do they need to have their own marketing person? Do they need to have their own product person? You know, is it, is it, do you have a, a sort of a microcosm or do you have a little bit of some shared services that can support them? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so there is definitely the shared service side, right? Is that it would be completely inoperable for our student CEOs have to start from scratch every single semester, right? For them to say, okay, what bread am I going to carry for our grilled cheese? Where am I going to source coffee from, right? Like that's what our corporate office exists. Those, those are very important things, but those are not part of what allow us to teach leaders to be great leaders, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is a great shared service. I like I like your term for that, a shared service model where that's what our support center, our headquarters exists for. I must say it a hundred times a day, this place, I'm acting like I'm sitting in my headquarters, is a cost center. This is not the important work. The important work exists in our cafes. Our jobs all exist to serve them, right? So we need to be able to put the things in place that allow them to make great decisions. So they have their vendor network, right? They have their, their infrastructure, they have their systems that they go in and they have to order their items and the revenue is projected for them out of the corporate office, but they have to make the decisions to say, you know what, weather is expected to be really, really bad today. And what we see is th revenue goes down 30%. So they have to be able to adjust how much product that they, they order so that the inventory that's done at the individual cafe reflects the kind of performance that they're gonna see on the ground. So it is very shared service. Like it's not like the eye in the sky just does it all for them and mm -hmm. they just sort of show up and just operate the business. Like they have to make a lot of critical They gotta decisions. pull the level or levers, turn the dials, all that stuff. They do, right? And 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 that's, and look, there's oftentimes mistakes in that, right? Like they, they have weekly financial reviews um, not with me, they have it sort of with their pods, their operational pods that are done re re regionally. So they're getting a direct look at the financial performance of their business on a weekly basis, right? Like they, they also have their own apps that that show them sort of like their, their revenue, their labor, which is all real time. But every single week, they're essentially going through miniature p and reviews, right? Yeah. So they're getting a lot of feedback really directly and really, really quickly. Um, and, and oftentimes we mess things up at corporate, right? Like we might not have things done properly for them at corporate, right? So there, this shared service goes both directions and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a fragile ecosystem if people have ego, you know, if, so if people are pointing fingers at each other versus again, the bigger picture here, that North star for us is we're in the business to make life better, right? Like how are we going to impact young leaders and young entrepreneurs to make life better? And I think that takes a lot of sort of the edginess off of what we do because there's a greater purpose than just purely making money in our business. Yeah. I have some rapid fire questions for you though. All right. You ready? Uh, probably not, but, but go ahead. There's, there's uh, there may be a curveball in here. We'll see. 
I was a pitcher, so I, I could never hit curveball. Okay, so I'm so, sure that will continue. You know, this one's straight down the middle <laughs> of home plate. So what's your favorite Saxby's coffee drink? So my favorite has historically been what we call the cure. So it's a it's a secret menu item. So it is it's espresso over ice, um, you know, filled with uh, coconut water. So it's actually it sounds strange, right? So like espresso is bitter, coconut water is sweet, but they actually because the way our, our espresso is roasted, it's actually roasted to to mix well with other items versus just to, you know peculiar to stand on its own. And so you have to like coconut water. Like there's a lot of people who don't like coconut water, but if you like coconut water, the cure is actually unbelievable. It's so refreshing. It's so easy drinking. And so, so today it's actually just a secret menu at Saxby's, but um, that's day. typically my go-to. And in a cold brew, cold brew is our number one selling skew, right? It's just, it's a very versatile item. It's very refreshing. It's light, it finishes sweet. So I drink a lot of our cold brew, but the cure is the, is the unique go-to. That's the deal. Okay. Well, we talked a lot about work, but what's your favorite activity or hobby to do outside work? Pilates. All right. You got to tell us about that. Probably, yeah, probably not expecting that answer. Um, it's been, it's just been really like life improving for me, right? Is I'm, I'm a, I'm a pretty intense person by nature. Um, you know, like I, I, I like to go after things. Um, and so I think doing something like CrossFit would only like put me over the edge. You know, I needed something that was a little bit more like meditative, good for my mental, my, my mental, my soul and sort of my body as well. And so Pilates has just been like amazing for me. I've done it for, for probably 10 years now. Um, my wife owns a, a Pilates studio, which obviously helps as well, but I feel, I feel lengthened. I feel strengthened. Uh, my flexibility is great. I broke my back when I was 17. Oh my goodness. Um, so it helped, you know, taking care of my core, knock on wood. I've never had any back pain since I started Pilates, you know? And so it's just, it's awesome. Like I, I really like it. I, I like it from a mental, a soul perspective and a, and a body perspective. It's, I, I, I can't get enough of it. Unexpected, but a great answer. Thank you. What's the most unusual skill uh, you possess that people might not know about? I don't think I have many skills. Um, I already sort of used that card with Pilates, right? I've, I've been doing it for so long. Yeah, it's got to be like I'm I pretty juggle. decent at, at Pilates. <laughs> I, I still can juggle three tennis balls. Um, on a good day, I can still dunk a basketball. Hey, there you, you go. You know, like may, maybe that. Like my, my son is actually surprised. I, I did it this past weekend. We were out playing. Um, you know, and, and he was, he was very surprised. I'm not sure other people are that impressed by it, but uh, he, he was. And you're like, yeah, bro. Yeah, he's nine. It's not that hard to impress him. So yeah. He can dunk. Yeah. All right. Well, if you weren't in the coffee industry, what would you be doing? I would probably be like a coach or a teacher. You know, like I, I do think of myself a bit as an educator, just being in the, in the higher ed space, but um, yeah, sports, sports are just such a, a great, teacher, you know, and such a great like life lesson provider. So I, I would likely be sort of in that space. But again, I, I love scale, right? Like I love being able to scale something and allowing your impact to scale with it. And so that's why I think like being able to be in the impact space, but in business, just that that's really checks the box for me. It's powerful. Well, what's next for Nick Bayer? You know, I think we've got something special in that we're, we're a first mover with what we've created here as a business, right? Like that flywheel that our social and our education outcomes have created a really successful financial business is, is pretty special, right? Like that's such an amazing opportunity. And so I think constantly having a healthy paranoia in our business that like we can't just rest on our laurels and be like, look at all the student CEOs we've impacted. Look at all the people we haven't yet impacted, mm -hmm. right? And, and figuring out how to be able to slam the gas on this, to be able to continue to have the quality of relationships and outcomes we have with even greater quantity, right? Like that's that's really the important part. And so that's why my Pilates is so important to me. Keep my keep my mind and my soul and my mm -hmm. body and my body right. Um, and, and, and being able to just sort of like share the mission and the purpose and share the success of this business, right? Because I think that this business, I, I, I said it many, many years ago where people are like, God, it's actually just a pretty good culture back in Philly, but like, how are you gonna have it when you go to DC and Pittsburgh and Oklahoma City and all these other places? Mm -hmm. And I said, we're gonna bet heavily that because we're so decentralized and so, you know, so entrepreneurial, we have student CEOs everywhere, our culture will get better as we get bigger versus getting worse mm -hmm. as we get bigger. And so far, that, that's exactly how it's playing out, right? So like, that's the challenge that we have for ourselves. It's the challenge that I have for myself as a leader is can our culture actually get better as we get bigger and we spread our geography or not? 
right? Mm-hmm. And so that, that's that's that healthy paranoia that, that we can sort of slam the gas and really bring this opportunity to to a significant portion of, of the next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs. Mm. Well, something that's been clear to me in the conversation is there are lives that you've impacted that um, and that your team is impacted and you should be proud of the work that you're doing. Your team should be proud of their commitment. I think um, uh, if there's any encouragement that I would have is to just not stop, keep going, help as many people as you possibly can. It's really a powerful story. I would say um, if there's anything that uh, I've appreciated most about uh, our conversation is your level of authenticity and your passion is real. It's contagious. And I hope you don't ever stop. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been so awesome speaking to you, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.